level, but I also come to you from someone that has had three children participate in grassroots hockey and have grown up and, uh, you know, taken kids to the rink. I've coached my kids and I've also been a parent on a team that my kids have participated on. So um, I think both of those experiences kind of offer a certain perspective and, and kind of have, have helped me in the, through the process of, of trying to understand development and uh, the, the respective uh, stages along the way, if you will. So um, that, that's kind of my background in a, in a nutshell, trying to understand the whole development process. How does it take place? How do you make a player better? And it really, quite honestly, started with my kids when, when I started to get involved with, with coaching the youth age group. Because I think, you know, you guys are at a particular point in, in, their, in their development stage that is so impressionable. And you can have such a huge impact on, on the kids that you're coaching. So I went on this kind of escapade on trying to understand development. Um, and, and it took me down kind of an intellectual road, and, and that's what I'm going to bring to you today. I know, and, and, you know, you may like it, you may not, but uh, tough. I'm, I, I already put it together, so I hope you'll, I hope you'll appreciate it. Um, the next thing, and this is where the intellectual side of it's going to come in a little bit, is I want to discuss the science of skill acquisition and how learning takes place. Because I don't think there's enough of this that goes on in, in what we do, because in essence, coaches are teachers, right? So the best teachers are teachers that apply strategies that leverage uh, knowledge on how people learn. So if we're gonna be good coaches and we're gonna be good teachers, it might make sense to st step back a little bit and have a discussion on, well, how do kids learn? How does skill acquisition actually take place? And if we have a, a basic understanding of that, now we can say to ourselves, okay, what's the best approach here? What kind of a strategy or a coaching methodology can I apply that will leverage what I know as far as how people learn? Okay, so that's kind of the road I want to go down today a little bit, is just, the, just kind of a, 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 a basic rudimentary understanding of the science of skill acquisition, okay? And then the last point is, is and then I just talked to that point, is based on, on what we discuss, let's try to come up with some coaching strategies that are going to leverage what we've learned as far as uh, the science of skill acquisition and what neurologists and, and people that are, that are have dedicated their life to trying to understand this process are telling us. Okay? Does that make sense? So that's kind of, when I put this presentation together, this is what, it, this is the thought process that I went through. So that, this is going to be my attempt at, at trying to accomplish this. Okay? And if anybody has any comments or questions, so I'm going to give you an example of a real life example of how this takes place. Okay? And it happened by accident. In the talent code, they talk about, they, they give this example about Brazilian soccer, right? And, Bra and Brazil has done an amazing thing as far as continuing to develop the most elite players in the world in unusually high percentage relative to the rest of the world. Well, how does it happen? What are they doing that the rest of the world isn't? Okay? And there's some that will suggest that it's a combination of nature and nurture, right? They've got a friendly climate for soccer. They have a passion for the game. It's almost like, you know, we'd like to think we have it in, in, in Canada. You know, hockey is, they eat, sleep, and drink it, right? Nationwide, it's almost a religion to them. For us, it's a religion in, in the United States. We live in the hockey hotbeds, I guess, or we love hockey, but that's what they're talking about as, par, as far as their passion for hockey. And then they have this, right? They've got a diverse population. 40% of the population's poor, okay? And so a lot of them see soccer as the means to get out of that plight. So there's some that would suggest that this is the formula and this is why Brazil is developing better soccer players than the rest of the world. The problem with that argument is that those three things existed in the 1930s and 40s and they weren't developing soccer players. So what changed? In the 1950s, they, Brazil started to train in a particular way. They stumbled on a tool, okay? that helped them, that helped in that development process, okay? They found a way to increase their learning velocity, and they were unaware of it at the time. They stumbled on this thing, okay? 
and the, and the tool was this game of futsal. How many people heard of that? In Portuguese, it's called soccer in the room, right? It was, it was invented by a Uruguayan coach, and it was a training tool. It, it was a rainy day training tool. So when they couldn't, they couldn't play soccer because the weather stunk and it was raining, they would bring it inside, and they would play this game. So what is it? Number one, it's regarded as the incubator of the Brazilian soul. It's taken on a life of its own. Kids play it in the neighborhoods and at the soccer academies. Ages 7 to 12, they play on average three days a week. Top Brazilian players play thousands of hours of futsal, okay? This guy here, Janino, he's a great Brazilian player. He never kicked a full-size soccer ball until he was 14 years old. He's one of the best players in the world. So here's the game. The ball's half the size. It weighs twice as much, and it hardly bounces. They train on basketball-sized patches of concrete, wooden floors, dirt. It's a poor country. So they're finding any area in between their apartment buildings or whatever that they can find to play this game. Each side plays with five or six guys. The rhythm of the game resembles basketball or hockey because it's end-to-end -end action, because they've, they've, what, have, what have they done? They've confined the space, right? So speed is an essential aspect of it. A lot of people that have studied this, this uh, Brazilian soccer believe that this is the impetus to their Brazilian skills. This is where they were born. Does this remind you of anything? Why is it effective? Number one, the math. Players touch the ball on average six, six times more per minute, according to a Liverpool University study. They have way more touches. The ball is small and heavy, and it demands and rewards more precise handling. You can't get out of a tight spot by booting the ball down the field. You've got to hang on to it. You've got to handle it. You're being forced to acquire those skills because of the nature of how the game's played. Sharp passing is paramount. The game is all about looking for angles and spaces, working quick combination with players. It's an understanding of time and space, right? And when you think about instinctive games, combative games like hockey, lacrosse, soccer, basketball, okay, when you, when you think about the nature of how the game is played, it's all about this. It's the understanding of time and space. It's jumping into windows of opportunity at the right time and then having the skill sets to be able to act on and execute uh, and take advantage of opportunities. That's what instinctive games are about, okay? Ball control is obviously critical. Like, take it to our sport. Nothing? Small area games, street hockey, informal settings, right? USA Hockey's whole small area game initiative, okay, is based on this premise. And it makes sense. I'll give you an example. There was a, there was a guy, and he was an elementary school teacher in Leeds, England. His name is Simon Clifford. He went over to Brazil. He's, he was also a soccer coach, loved soccer. Went over to Brazil for a year on his own dime to study what they were doing. And he thought he was going to see these soccer academies with these big green soccer fields and strength and conditioning programs and this, that, and the other thing. <clears throat> and what he saw was a poor country that had no money, and he saw kids playing in between apartment buildings on dirt floors or concrete. And he saw them playing this game with a ball that was half the size of a soccer ball. And, and it was like an aha moment for the guy. So he goes back to Leeds, England. He, he, he taught at a uh, Catholic elementary school. He took a group of 10-year-olds and he started, he started to apply this process. At eight, and they laughed at him in England, all the soccer gurus. At age 14... Okay, his team beat the, the Scottish national team and the Irish national team in the U14 level four years later. So there's something to this, right? For me, there's, there's really something to this. When I, when I was reading about this stuff, it was just jumping out at me that, that, you know, when I think about what's going on and what USA Hockey's trying to do with their ADM model as far as an age-appropriate approach and that, that small game initiative, and there's a lot of resistance to that small game initiative because people don't understand the nature of the game and the skill circuits that are required to be good. That's what small games do. Is so we're in these for? types of games, the game itself serves as the factory, okay, of precisely the sort of encounters that coaches want to teach. The game becomes the teacher. It's experiential learning, okay? How many people have heard of the, game, the book The Inner Game of Tennis? 
It's a terrific book. It, it, it talks a lot of bit about how, how, we, how you learn. It's a great book, but one of the things they talk about in that book is, is, is they, they use the term childlike learning. It's, an un, it's unconscious learning. It's, it's like how a child learns how to walk. Nobody's got a dry erase board showing a child, hey, this is what you got to do. You got to stand up, get the weight on the balls of your feet, put one foot in front of the other. No, that's not how it works, right? The child sits in the middle of the room. He watches his brothers and sisters. He watches his parents, and his brain fires. And, it fire, and then he tries to get up and stumbles and falls, and, and the brain attends to the mistakes, and then it fires again, and then he might take a couple of steps, and then the, fi the neurons, they, they, they wire, and the my myelination process takes place. That's childlike learning. It's experiential learning. It's the most powerful way we learn. So why wouldn't we take advantage of that, knowing that concept, right? That's what futsal does.